grateful, Lord, for all the chances you give us, uh, not only to come to you and receive grace and mercy and forgiveness, but the way through your church and your gifts to the church, we can grow and be nourished. And so uh, we thank you. Thank you for the way your Holy Spirit can work in the body of Christ. Uh, bless our time together, not just this group, but all the groups, hundreds and hundreds of people here today. May they all send your grace and presence and power and love in a special way from the youngest and the oldest. Guide Tim, bless him as he shares with us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Tim Barnett. My mic is in. Wow. He's on it. Perfect. Thank you. You guys can hear me, right? All right. It is truly uh, an honor to be uh, up here and speaking to all of you. Um, I feel like I'm, you know, batting cleanup. Uh, there's, you know, we started with Pastor Don, and we had Rich Davis, and Paul Franks, and then who's this other guy, you know? It just doesn't seem right that I'm kind of in uh, with this host of uh, caliber of guys, but uh, uh, I'll take the gigs where I can get them. And so, here I am. And what I want to do right now is just kind of uh, introduce myself a little bit to you. Why am I kind of uh, up here talking about science in front of you? All. Well, it all goes back to a number of years ago when I went off to university and started my uh, degree as a, a physicist and mathematician. Uh, I took physics and math at New York University. And then from there, I went off to UOIT, which uh, is uh, in Oshawa. Actually, here came from Oshawa, which is pretty cool. Um, I actually got my Bachelor of Education there, did that for a year, and then from there went on to teach People's Christian Academy. I taught physics, science, I mean, I pretty much taught everything. I taught family studies. That was pretty cool. Not really. Uh, from there, I taught there for three years, and then from there I went off to uh, uh, New York Region District School Board, and, uh, and I've been doing LTOs, and I actually had an interview on... Uh, Saturday that I found out about it on Friday at lunch from a stranger, which that's a whole other story. And uh, and then, uh, so I've been doing supply work for them, uh, and I've, I've had the opportunity to teach biology, actually evolution, uh, in the public board, which is, uh, which is interesting. And then I actually started my own ministry, uh, it's an apologetics ministry, uh, you guys know what apologetics is? It's where you apologize for what you believe. <laughs> uh, no, it's where you give a, a defense for your faith. And I like to do that. Um, in fact, I've had the opportunity to speak at a number of conferences. I was in Moncton a few uh, weeks ago, uh, speaking to some Christian school teachers. I had the opportunity to speak in Brampton uh, with, alongside Sean McDowell. I don't know if you guys know who Sean McDowell is. Uh, that's Josh McDowell's son. We got to go for dinner and he saw me speak. And, was kind of uh, kind of a dream come true. <laughs> Two highlights this year for me were meeting Sean McDowell and then having my second uh, child. So uh, and in that order. <laughs> <laughs> and right now I'm actually in the middle of doing my uh, my master's in philosophy at Southern University <coughs> Seminary. And actually this week is my final exams for the semester. And so I had three exams. I have one tomorrow, actually. Uh, I have a 20-page paper due on Friday. And yeah, I know, you're feeling my pain right now. And so I'll, I'll survive, okay? By you know, God's strength, uh, I'll survive. And then I'm kind of you know, having a good time uh, over Christmas holidays and you speak and that sort of thing. So that's kind of uh, where we're at. These beautiful people, from uh, tallest to shortest here, are my family, the Barnett clan. And uh, their names are on there. To see them, you know, in the in the sanctuary, be sure to say hi, because uh, they're all very friendly, except for uh, this one here. <laughs> you may not even recognize me without my without, uh, my beard, no, without my hair. Okay, that's actually me. Believe it or not. So what are we gonna do? What are we doing the next uh, three classes? Well. Uh, we're going to start today by talking about science and faith. Are they compatible? Look at the concepts and definitions. It's not as much fun, although I'm going to try and make it as lively as humanly possible for you. 
Uh, the next two are what I love to talk about, and that is the evidence for God, okay? So uh, on the eighth, I'm going to talk about the origin of the universe, um, and I'm going to talk about the fine-tuning of the universe. Uh, that's where we look at astronomy and physics, and that's, you know, my bread and butter. I love talking about this stuff. So if you're into that, you've got to come back. And then on the 8th uh, of January, I'm going to be speaking on the origin of life, okay, biology, and the origin of biological information, the DNA. And so you don't want to miss out on that, okay? So if you're not a science person like Pastor Don, <laughs> let me reassure you that I'm going to throw the ball to you so you can catch it. You might have to stretch for it, but you can catch it. Anyone can learn this material. You don't have to be a science major to get this stuff, okay? And I'm going to try and keep the material as accessible as possible, okay? As long as you're an active listener, you can get this material. And all of God's active listeners said, Amen. No, they said, let's get into it, okay? <laughs> so, you know, i I, I got to pray because I'm going to forget to pray. And then you guys are going to see what happens. I forget to pray before I start. It doesn't go well. It's like a train wreck, okay? So let's, let's, just, let's just pray. There are days uh, and weeks and months where we need to rely on your strength and, uh, and your mercy and your grace more than, more than usual. And so God, we thank you that you are faithful to provide strength and mercy. And, and God, right now, I ask that you, your presence would be felt in this place. We know that you're everywhere. You're omnipresent. But God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be real to us, uh, even right now as I'm, I'm praying. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together like this on a Wednesday night, and how you just fill this building with people, and how it's alive with, uh, with your Spirit, God. And so, um, pray that you just be with me as I speak, and those who are listening, give them ears to hear God. Pray all this in your name. Amen. All right, so why take a course like this? Uh, well, you all are going to have your reasons. Some of you just show up every Wednesday, you eat the meal, because it's great, and then you don't care what's being taught. You hear it could be basket weaving, and you just show up, okay? But others of you are here because you have questions surrounding science. And as a whole, uh, the church hasn't been doing a good job in, in teaching about science, okay? and and for a good reason, and, you know, you come to church, you learn about theology. But there's a good reason we need to be teaching congregations about science as well. And one of those reasons is because science is actually a gospel. You guys heard of gospels? It's a real word. Look it up. No, don't look it up. It's not a real word. <laughs> gospel comes, I didn't come up with the term, but it's actually a word that combines two words. Gospel and obstacle, okay? There are gospels that keep people from the faith. They're obstacles of the gospel. And when I talk to people, non-Christians, what they bring up, usually, more often than not, is some kind of scientific objection, especially if they're scientifically minded, okay? I don't believe in, you know, Christianity because of, and then they'll give their scientific rationale, okay? And so, because there are non-Christians who have these obstacle science, um, keeping them from the gospel, we should be equipping ourselves, okay? We need to be conversing these things. The other thing is, we have Christians, okay, who are going off into university or talking with people who are scientifically minded, and they're being talked out of their faith because of science, okay? Science, I think, is that it's not properly understood. And in fact, this can be used, I think, I mean, I talked about this stuff when I was supply teaching. Uh, the other day I was at Huron Heights, and I was talking with this girl, she was an atheist, and uh, she had no idea that there was good scientific reasons to believe that God exists. And she got excited, I got excited, the people who were listening got excited. It was a very cool um, opportunity I had because of uh, the knowledge that I had. And I want to give you some of that as we work our way through. So how do we start? Well, it's the impression of most people today that science has killed and buried God. That is to say, science has shown once and for all that God is dead. It's my belief that science has done no such thing. I'd like to spend the next hour or so showing you that. Moreover, to demonstrate that science has done no such thing, I want to look at one of the, uh, most, uh, the greatest discoveries or scientific achievements in the 20th and 21st centuries. What I'm talking about is the Human Genome Project. 
You guys heard of the Human Genome Project? Well, the first head of the Human Genome Project was none other than James Watson. You guys heard of James Watson? What he's famous for? James Watson. Does anyone know? I'd be really impressed. Yeah, he is a co-discoverer of the DNA molecule. He won a Nobel Prize in 1953 with Francis Crick. And so, James Watson, he actually started the Human Genome Project. So he's the founder of the Human Genome Project that would eventually map out all 3.5 billion nucleotide bases of the DNA. These are like letters in your DNA. All of your cells, all 100 trillion cells in your body have your DNA. Your DNA, if uh, stretched out, would be about six feet long, as tall as I am. And that's in all, all of your cells. Now, some people point to a guy like James Watson and say, listen, look, he's an atheist. And that's because science leads to atheism. But not so fast. Because there's another gentleman by the name of Francis Collins. And Francis Collins is a Christian. And Francis Collins actually took over for James Watson as the head of the Human Genome Project and saw it to its completion in 2003. Now, uh, Francis Collins, he's an MD, he's a medical doctor, and if that's not good enough, the guy has a PhD in, uh, in, in genetics, okay? So he's got a PhD in MD. These two are at the height of their fields in biology, and yet they both have different worldviews, different views. One's an atheist and one's a scientist. Clearly, this demonstrates that science isn't the issue here. Something else is the issue, okay? Something more foundational. In fact, what divides them is not their science, it's their worldview. Now, uh, Rich Davis and Paul Franks have been talking about worldviews. I'm not gonna go in deep with this stuff. Worldviews are like belly buttons. Everybody's got them, but no one thinks much about them, okay? <laughs> and so, your worldview asks the big questions of life. It asks, you know, why are we here? Um, where do we come from? Where are we going? Those kinds of things. And what I would submit is the question that we really need to be asking is which worldview provides the best foundation for science? We're going to come back to that question. But what I first want to do is start looking at this question, has science buried faith in God? To answer the question, has science buried faith in God? You have to have a proper definition of faith, a proper definition of science, and a proper definition of God. Okay? That makes sense? So let's start by looking at one of the most misunderstood words in the English language. And that is faith, okay? <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I don't like the word faith. And I try not to use it with people. Because it has too much baggage. You guys know what I'm talking about? What, what words get tagged onto the word faith? You can, this is the interactive portion of the program. <laughs> <laughs> it's what? Blind. Yeah, blind. There's a hint. They're on the thing that tip. <laughs> blind, leap of. Yeah. yeah. I didn't want to leave you guys hanging. So blind faith, leap of faith, that's what people associate with, with this idea of faith. In fact, Mark Twain, he famously said that faith is believing what you know ain't true. Okay? And so you have uh, the primary attack from the new atheists. These are these atheists that, you know, they call them the new atheists because they got attitude. Okay? They're not just atheists, but they're atheists with attitude. And so uh, these new atheists, they pick reason against faith. They're opposites on their view, okay? So on the one hand, you have reason, and reason takes you to and more evidence takes you to more reason and more knowledge, okay? And then on the other hand, you have faith. And that's where you have no evidence, so it's just wishful thinking, okay? And most people think, when you say I'm a person of faith, or you say I have faith, they think that's what you're talking about. Oh, you're wishful thinking, okay? And just to give you some examples, Richard Dawkins, okay, probably the most notorious atheist out there, in his book, The God Delusion, page five, he says, faith is persistent false belief held in the face of strong contradictory evidence. Okay? Now, if that's not bad enough, Richard Dawkins, he's extreme, but he says this, he says, it is fashionable to wax apocalyptic about the threat to humanity posed by the AIDS virus, Mad Cow disease, and many others. But I think the case can be made that faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus but harder to eradicate. Faith is uh, being belief that isn't based on evidence is the principal vice of any religion, okay? This book, The God Delusion, 
that has these kind of definitions, it's sold over you know two million copies. So this is this is this is spreading. Okay, a guy like Stan Harris, he's a member of the New, New Atheists as well. He wrote a book called The End of Faith. You think a guy who wrote a book called The End of Faith would know what faith is, right? Well, he says. Tell it about Christian that his wife is cheating on him, or that frozen yogurt can make a man invisible, and he's likely to require as much evidence as anyone else, and to be persuaded only to the extent that you give it. Tell him that the book he keeps by his bed was writ uh, written by an invisible deity who will punish him with fire for eternity if he fails to accept this every incredible claim about the universe, and he seems to require no evidence whatsoever. Okay? And so this is what the new atheists say is faith. Okay? Now, is that biblical faith? Well, some people don't agree. Dr. John Lennox, this guy is an Oxford mathematician. He's got more letters after his name than in his name. Okay? He's got a PhD in mathematics. He's got a DSC, a doctor of science. And he's got a DPhil, uh, a doctor of philosophy. He says in his book, let me just recommend uh, this book. Uh, John Lennox, God's Undertaker. I don't know if he ever sold this in the, in the thing. I've read this a couple times. It's the best book on science and faith. Okay? Hands down. Um, and it actually, the title is God's Undertaker Has Science Buried uh, God. So it's kind of based off the, the same title. He says, faith is a response to the evidence, not rejoicing in the absence of it. Okay? Faith is a response to the evidence, not rejoicing in the absence of it. So uh, now, who are we going to believe? The new atheists, or John Lennox, or, or, or what? Well, let's do a little Bible study. Let's see what the Bible talk, uh, says about, about faith. So we'll start by looking at Mark. Okay, if you go to Mark 2, uh, if you don't have your Bibles here, I'll try and put some of the, the verses on the screen here. Mark 2 describes the story of Jesus hearing, healing the, the paralytic. You may remember the story. paralyzed man is brought to Jesus but the house is full, and so his friends actually hoist him onto the roof. They remove some of the roof so that they can actually lower him down to the feet of Jesus. Is this registering with some of you? I'm not making this stuff up. And Jesus sees this all happening, and the text says, he saw their faith, which is something we can totally get into. He saw their faith. Well, what did he really see? He saw their faith, and he says what? What does he say? Son, your Sins are forgiven, right? He says, your sins are forgiven. Now, anyone could say your sins are forgiven. I could walk into this room, tell you all, your sins are forgiven. Because it's an invisible thing. You don't know whether that's true or not. But to back up his claim, he doesn't just say, just take a blind leap of faith and believe me. No. To back up his claim, and these are the words on the screen, he says, but that you may know that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to the, he said to the paralytic, uh, rise, uh, pick up your bed and go home. And so he provided physical evidence to back up his invisible claim. Okay? Very, very interesting. Now you see this stuff all over the Bible. It's not just in one account here. If you go to the Old Testament, you know the story of where God appears to Moses in the burning bush. And he tells, uh, he tells Moses, well, you've got to go talk to the elders of Israel, and then you're going to take, you're going to go take the elders of Israel to the king of Egypt, and you're going to basically tell him to let my people go. And Moses is thinking, well, like all of us, we're thinking, well, how, why, why would they believe a word that I would say to them? Why would the king of Egypt believe me? Why would the elders believe me? And if you go to chapter 4, Verses 1 to 5, this is how it plays out. Uh, Moses says, but behold, they will not believe you or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? He knew what was in his hand, by the way. What's that in your hand? He said, a staff. He said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. Moses actually ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. And then put a comma there. Why is God telling him to do all this stuff? Why is he telling him to do all these miracles in front of them? Well, he doesn't leave us guessing. It says in the next verse, okay? Verse 5 says, 
That they may believe that the Lord, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Here's the good. So you have to just say, go to them and say, you know, just believe. Just believe. No, he says, here's some evidence to back it up. I mean, this is all over the place. Go back to the New Testament. You have Peter's sermon at Pentecost. Everyone's filled with the Holy Spirit. Men are speaking in tongues. And other people are saying, hey, I understand that guy, but he's, he's a Galilean. How come I can understand what he's saying? And some people are mocking. They're saying, no, these guys are drunk. Peter says, no, it's only the third hour. Can't be drunk. And then Peter chimes in and says, actually, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel. And then he's giving the sermon. He says, actually, Jesus' death and resurrection, that's actually a fulfillment of the prophecy in David. And then he says, and actually, Jesus actually rose from the dead, and we are witnesses. This is all in this sermon. And then he finishes the sermon with this. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain, with certainty. Can you believe that? You can know for certain. Well, where does our certainty come from? How, how can he claim that they will know this for certain? Well, it's because he's backed it up with prophecy and miracles. And, and raising Jesus from the dead. All of those things provide the knowledge base, the certainty that we can have. All right. Oh, John 20. When are we going to be in John 20? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say 2020, but I used that. Uh, John tells us on no uncertain terms that he recorded what he recorded so people like you and I would read, would see the evidence, or sorry, would read the evidence and believe, okay? And so you have John saying this at the end of his gospel. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that, may, that by believing you may have life in his name. So I'm recording all of this stuff down so that you will believe, okay? The evidence is there. Um, I mean, I was reading 1 John the other day. It starts like this. That was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to the eternal life. Do you think he meant that, you know, we can trust these guys? Like, they were actually witnesses. It finishes, the, the epistle finishes this way. It says, I write these things uh, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may take a leap of faith. No. That you may know that you have eternal life. And so, does this sound anything like Sam Harris? Does this sound anything like Richard Dawkins? Absolutely not. Richard Dawkins... St. Harris need to do a Bible study. <laughs> so how do I explain faith to people? Because I'm sure in a crowd this size, there's people here, you know, if I said, define faith, what is faith? You wouldn't have a clue. You wouldn't know where to start. And so how, here's how I describe it. Imagine you're standing at the edge of Niagara Falls, okay? You're watching this magnificent waterfall, and you notice a tightrope walker. A guy did this a couple of years ago, and they were claiming that it was the first time it was done. There was a guy who did it before him. His name was Charlie Blondin. He was hired, I think by the American side, to just walk across all day long. He did all these cool stunts. He actually bought a water bottle. Now, I'm just doing this because I wanted to get a drink. But he actually took a water bottle, lowered it down, picked up some water, brought it back up. This is in the middle. He didn't have a harness on. But one of, his, one of his really cool tricks was he filled a wheelbarrow with stones. And he would actually walk across on this wire. And he'd do this all day, and people would watch. And so imagine, and you're watching this, and he comes over to you, and he says, Hey, do you have faith that I can do it again? And you say, Yeah, of course, I've seen you do it all day long. And then he says, Okay, dumps out the rocks and says, Hop in. <laughs> right? That's what real faith is, though. It's an active trust, but it's based on the evidence, okay? You see him do it all day. You know he can do it. And then you actually put yourself in, in the wheel world. It's active trust. And so that means that sci when scientific evidence goes up for God, blind faith would technically go down. But biblical faith would go up. 
Okay? When, when scientific evidence goes up, uh, you have your biblical faith going up as well. And that's why today I have more faith than when I, when I became a Christian, from what I know from science. Just as I have more faith in my wife today than I did when I married her, I want to say five years ago. <laughs> five years ago. <laughs> so, you guys see how that works? So, biblical faith is I can trust based on evidence. Um, I was, uh, I just added this the other day. I was uh, reading this book. It's called The uh, Mind Your Faith by David Horner. And he describes actually four components of faith, and I need to summarize them to three. Here's three things that are involved in faith. And that is, one, faith has an object, okay? The thing you put your faith in, that's the object. The second thing is faith has, a, has content, okay? It's the details about what it means to put your faith in that thing. And finally, faith has a commitment, okay? And that is the act of trust uh, or commitment of where, where you're putting your trust in, what you're putting your trust in. Okay, so you can think of this as, you know, we've all stepped on an airplane, maybe been a bit nervous about the flight. When you put your faith in an airplane uh, to take you somewhere from point A to point B, and I hear point B is beautiful this time of year. <laughs> but the airplane is the object, the content is the belief that it will get you there, and then when you actually step on the plane, that's when you're putting your, your faith in it. Okay? So, so faith is not opposed to reason. Uh, actually, reason assesses the content, and faith is the part that trusts in it, okay? So faith and trust actually are, are complementary. Um, faith tells you if something or someone is, or sorry, reason tells you if something or someone is trustworthy, and then faith actually puts your trust in that thing or person, okay? So the opposite of reason is not faith, it's irrationality, and, uh, and the opposite of faith is not reason, it's unbelief. Or not, or not trusting. Okay, so Richard Dawkins, he says in The Devil's Delusion, the next, uh, The Devil's Chaplain, uh, the next time someone tells you that something is true, why not say to them, what kind of evidence is there for that? And if they can't give you a good answer, I hope you'll think very carefully before you believe a word they say. What well, we need to ask Richard Dawkins, we need to take his advice and say, what kind of evidence is there for believing your definition of faith. And the reality is, he doesn't give any. He just asserts that faith is believing what you know ain't true. Okay? And uh, there is one spot, I don't think it's in the God delusion, but there's one argument that he gives from the Bible that, that where he tries to argue that, you know, uh, biblical faith is believing what you know ain't true. And he goes to the story of Thomas, okay? Uh, you know, doubting Thomas. So some people bring up the story of Thomas as a, as a counterexample to my view. Um, Jesus appeared after his death to the disciples in the upper room, but Thomas wasn't there. Okay? Thomas finds out what happened, and he doesn't believe the disciples. In fact, he's, he's pretty skeptical. In fact, in verse 25, he says, uh, So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord, but... He said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprints of the nails and put my finger in the place of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. That's what Thomas says. So eight days later, uh, his disciples uh, again were inside the upper room. Uh, Thomas was with them. Jesus came. The doors were shut. And Jesus stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, uh, reach here with your finger and uh, see with your, your hands and reach here with your hand and put, your, uh, put it in my side and do, uh, and do not be unbelieving but believing. This is the New American Standard uh, Version. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. By the way, if Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, there's lots of arguments you can use. Um, but I take them usually to this verse. Uh, he says, my Lord and my God, okay? And they'll say, no, no, he said, my Lord, and then looked up and said, my God. That doesn't make any sense. He said to him, my Lord and my God, okay? And that's actually a quote from David, and, and so it's, uh, 
It's a powerful argument that Thomas called him God, and Jesus accepted the worship. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, uh, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. And this is the argument that, this is what Dawkins will say. He said, see, blessed are those who don't need any evidence and just take a blind leap of faith. That's what Jesus is teaching. That's what Dawkins wants us to believe. But there's a problem with this. The problem is, and uh, Josh Samuel, he taught right here on a Sunday uh, after um, church on how to read the Bible. What you want to do is read the context. It turns out if you just read the next verses, we've actually already looked at them. The next verses go on to say this. <coughs> Therefore, many other signs Jesus uh, also performed in the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe. And so, it seems like on Dawkins' view, there's a contradiction here. He's saying, believe, uh, take a blind leap of faith and believe, and then he's saying, then John's saying, no, no, I've written all these things so you have some evidence to believe. No, there's no contradiction here. He's saying, blessed are those who did not see. All of us, we haven't seen, have we? We haven't seen. And yet we still believe. But why do we believe? Well, John goes on. Therefore, therefore, he's provided evidence for us, written in the book so that we'll believe. Okay? There's a direct connection. When you see the word therefore in, in the Bible, there's something usually prior to it that, uh, that is connecting to that statement. Okay? And so there's no, there's no conflict here. Um, Dawkins is, is dead wrong. The Bible doesn't teach that we should take a blind view. The Bible is very clear that we should, uh, that we believe based on, on evidence, really good evidence, actually. I'm going to take a little break here, because uh, you guys look like you, you're falling asleep. <laughs> so maybe, uh, is there going to be, is there coffee out there? Do I have to make it? <laughs> didn't, didn't you bring? No, there it is. There's stuff right out there. All you have to do is go out there and get it. Right out there. Okay. So, we'll be back in uh, four and a half minutes. So, where were we? So, we looked at, we looked at science. Or we looked at faith. Uh, and I think we've established that real biblical faith is active trust. It's not against the evidence. But it actually, uh, it actually is compatible with evidence. And so, what I'd like to do now is look at science. What is, what is science, and maybe some background of science. And uh, so what I'd like to do is start by looking at the history of science, okay? Uh, at the foundation of science lies the conviction that the universe is orderly. Uh, with, without this belief, science would literally be impossible. Many historians of science and scientists have inquired as to why science arose in the West, but nowhere else. Uh, why was science still born in places like uh, China and Africa? What was so special about the West? Well, Melvin Calvin, he's a Nobel Prize winner in, in biochemistry, he said this, As I try to discern the origin of that conviction, I seem to find in the basic notion discovered 2,000 or 3,000 years ago, and enunciated uh, first in the Western world by the ancient Hebrews, namely, that the universe is governed by a single God, and not the product of the whims of many gods, each governing his own province according to his own laws. This monotheistic view seems to be the historical foundation for modern science. Okay, so this is not a trivial thing. Uh, what, what Calvin is saying is that theism, specifically monotheism, is the fertile soil uh, for which modern science could plant its roots and grow. So theism, that is belief in God, is not a science stopper, but actually the modern science starter. Listen, when I talk to people who don't share my views, they'll often say that intelligent design or belief in God, that's a science stopper. And you need to know that that is so far from the truth. In fact, the facts tell us that, that theism was the modern science starter, okay? I like how uh, C.S. Lewis put it. He said, men became, or men become scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver or a legislator. 
Okay? So who are these original men of science uh, who believed in a lawgiver? Well, Lewis was talking about these men. Uh, Francis Bacon, the father of uh, modern science. Galileo, who we'll come back to in a second. Kepler. You have Blaise Pascal, Robert Boyle, Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday, Mendel, Pasteur, Calvin, James Clerk, Maxwell. These are the giants of science, and they were all theists. Many of them were Bible-believing Christians. Okay? For these men, God was, was the inspiration for their science, not a hindrance to their science. Okay? This is a very important fact of history. In fact, you know, some, some will say, yeah, sure, everybody was a Christian, you know, it was completely divorced from their science. That's not true. Kepler put it beautifully. Uh, he said, I wanted to become a theologian. For a long time I was restless. Now, however, behold, how through my effort, God is being celebrated in astronomy. He's being glorified through astronomy. In fact, uh, another famous physicist, James Clerk Maxwell, I mean, arguably... Uh, the most famous physicist next to uh, Newton and Einstein. He had a Latin inscription carved into the doors of the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University that said, Magna opera, uh, Magna opera Domini Exposita and Domini's Voluntatis Asus. You guys all know what that means, right? It means, it means, great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Yeah, Psalm 111, 2, verse 2. And so actually when I speak to scientists, I tell them, you have to put this on the door, the door frame of your classroom, your science classroom. Your students need to know entering that they don't check their brain at the door. Science is not something divorced from their theology. No, the reason we do science is because of uh, it's, it's God's works, it's God's uh, handiwork. And so Maxwell, one of the greatest physicists of all time, saw no incompatibility between science and faith. Now I mentioned Galileo a moment ago, and I thought, you know what, we should spend like five minutes just talking about this whole Galileo controversy. Because it's so popular, it's often used as an argument uh, against my belief and in favor of science versus religion, okay? And so uh, let's, look at, let's look at this for a moment. There's a very popular view uh, that, that's going around that science and religion are enemies to each other. Uh, however, this is regarded by most uh, historians of science as a myth, okay? Uh, the idea that religion is at war with uh, science is called the conflict thesis, okay? It's called the conflict thesis. Now, let me, let me uh, kind of describe how this, this plays out. Um, they'll say, you know, Galileo was opposed uh, was in favor of uh, the sun being the center of the solar system, not the earth, and that and the church didn't like that, and so the church you know, put them under house arrest, they disciplined them, um, because they're anti-science. That's not actually how it played out. Galileo was actually opposed to Aristotelianism. Listen, if you're at a Christmas party, you're talking with someone, <laughs> that you don't want to talk to, just say, let me tell you about Aristotelianism. You know, they'll quickly screw you up. Uh, so Aristotelian, a, a part of it means an all-encompassing uh, paradigm, but where it relates to science is it, it held that the Earth was at the center of the solar system, that the heavens were these uh, immutable, that is, unchanging heavens, that there was the sun were these uh, perfect concentric spheres. Um, so this all comes from Aristotle. So what really happened with this whole controversy? I'll just talk about three things. First, the first people who opposed Galileo weren't the ch wasn't the church. It was actually the Italian philosophers. Okay, these were people that held to this Aristotle's philosophy, Aristotelianism. Okay, and so that was it was a conflict of worldview right from the start. Uh, Galileo was looking at the evidence, he saw that, hey, there's these spots on the sun that don't look right, and so that was against the Aristotelian philosophy. He said that uh, he saw these supernova in the, in the heavens, what's a supernova? It's an exploded star, okay? And so you're looking at these star guts as it expands uh, throughout the, the sky. And so 
And so that didn't line up with these immutable heavens. And so, and so there was a conflict there. So Galileo was pro-science, and these guys were pro their philosophy. Second, one must remember the historical context. This was during the Reformation. The church had kind of adapted this Aristotelian philosophy with, with their theology. And so when you attack the philosophy, well, that was, they thought they were, you were attacking the church. They were already losing their authority, they thought, because of the Reformation. They didn't want to lose this. And so, uh, and so that's why the church pushed back. Another thing was, when Galileo wrote his, his scientific works, he wrote in Italian. And that was just the common language. He didn't write it in Latin. So he kind of upset the apple cart in, in that way as well. But here's the kicker. Galileo was a jerk. <laughs> Galileo wrote a book called The Dialogue Concerning the Two Principal Systems of the World, in which he put the ideas of the Pope, the ideas on, of the Pope on the lips of a character he called Simplicio. Simplicio translates simpleton, buffoon, okay? He called the Pope a buffoon. And you're not going to go very far if you do that. Okay, so there's a lot of elements involved in this whole story that most people don't, uh, most people don't know about. They just think it's a science versus religion thing, and that's not true. It's not science versus theism, science versus religion. It's theism versus naturalism. Okay, so let's talk about this. Let's go deeper in this idea of science. You know, science is notoriously hard to define. Okay? So what I'd like to do is just give you two senses of how the word science is being used in our culture. The one way it's being used as a, is as a methodology, okay? the scientific method, you've probably heard of it. This is what we teach in, in school. And so this is how scientists do science, okay? the scientific method. The other way science is being used, it's being used philosophically. Okay? Philosophically, what I mean is, you can't come to certain conclusions. Only certain conclusions are permissible. Now, those conclusions have to be naturalistic. Okay, this idea of naturalism was, is best described as, uh, you guys know a TV show by Carl Sagan called Cosmos? And he would say the universe is all there is, all there ever was, and all there ever will be. That's naturalism. Okay? Nature is all there is. And so, and so, just so I have my cards on the table, I'll readily admit that most explanations are explained naturally because we live in a material world. And I am not a material girl. <laughs> <laughs> Different kind of materialism. Um, and so, but not everything is explained. Not everything, which we'll look at over the next two lessons. But here's a kind of an illustration. I hope this is helpful for you, okay? Here's an illustration of the difference between the methodology and the philosophy of science. Okay, imagine that a well-known person is murdered um, in the church, okay? Someone here, right now. The mayor shows up, the chief of police shows up, all these forensic detectives, okay? They want to find the killer. And so the chief shows up and he says, listen, forensic detectives, I want you to use your best forensic methodology to find the killer. Okay? And the detectives are like, sure, and they start getting their test tubes out and they get, they get all their you know, science stuff out. And then the chief says, oh, by the way, you can't implicate a white man. You can't implicate a white man. Now, what is the question that the forensic detective is going to immediately come to his mind? What if a white man did? You see what's going on there? The chief wants to exclude one of the possible explanations, conclusions, before even looking at the evidence. This is precisely what's going on in science, okay? And just to prove that to you, here's a quote from uh, Richard Lewontin. This guy is at Harvard University, he's a geneticist. This guy is like the top of the food chain, he's an atheist, and he just, in this very candid quote, just put it all out there. He says, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. He says, we take the side of science, in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of the 
its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories. Just so stories, you know, like how the tiger got its stripes, how the leopard got its spots, you know, kid stories. That's what, in science, you get a lot of just so stories, okay? Because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori, that is, before the evidence, before we can look at the evidence, adherence to a material cause, to material causes, to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated, here it is. If you didn't catch anything I just said. <laughs> Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. You can't implicate a white man. That's what he's saying, okay? Before we even look at the, the evidence, let's exclude the possibility. You guys are probably thinking, you no, know, aren't scientists those objective pursuers of truth? Isn't that in the white lab coats? No, absolutely not. And listen, while we're on this, creation, when they say creationism isn't science, or intelligent design is not scientific, they're not talking about the methodology. They're talking about the philosophy. You're coming to the wrong conclusions. Only natural conclusions are allowed. Okay? And once you understand that this is actually going on, it kind of changes things. Like people will say, how come intelligent design components don't have, you know, all these articles in peer-reviewed journals? Because you can't even get into the peer-reviewed journals if your conclusions don't line up with what the scientific community has deemed to be appropriate conclusions. Okay? And that's just one of the reasons. Uh, some other things about science. Listen, there's a difference between science and scientists. Okay? Um, don't confuse science and scientists. John Lennox, in that book I showed you, said, uh, statements by scientists are not necessarily statements of science. In fact, Richard Dawkins is a scientist, and hardly anything he says is scientific. Okay? Uh, that's not like a put down, it's just that's the facts. Um, just because uh, there are some scientists at war with God does not mean that science is at war with God. Uh, just as there are some musicians, this is actually my neighbor, um, he's an atheist musician, and we've had lots of good conversations. But just because he's an atheist doesn't mean music is atheistic, okay? In the same way, just because there's brilliant scientists who are atheists doesn't mean science is atheistic, okay? So don't confuse those two. The other thing you don't want to confuse, you don't want to fuse, uh, confuse science and scientism, okay? Science and scientism. Scientism is the belief uh, that some people hold that science is the only way to get at truth. Okay? It's the only way you can know truth is through the scientific uh, process. So Peter Atkins, uh, he says, uh, in, because he's a scientist, he's a belief in scientism, he says, there is no reason to suppose that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. Uh, that's foolishness. Um, famous atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell, he said, this is very interesting, Whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. Can you see a problem with that last statement? Whatever, uh, whatever, or what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. It's actually self-refuting. How does he know that statement is true? Did he discover it with the scientific method? Of course not. The statement absolutely refutes itself. I mean, Bertrand Russell is a smart guy, but um, the statement is false. It refutes itself. There's another problem with this idea of scientism. Second, it says that no truth or knowledge can be gained from the humanities, can be gained through the theology, from the arts. Granted, science can tell you the chemical makeup of the paint you're using, but it can never tell you whether you're looking at a masterpiece or the product of a two-year-old. You guys can tell the difference, right? Are you going to the scientific method right now? No, of course not. You know that. And more fundamentally, science can tell you that 
adding arsenic to someone's coffee will kill them, but it can't tell you whether it's right or wrong to do so. Okay? In fact, Einstein, he put it this way. He said, you are right in speaking of the moral foundation of science, but you cannot turn around and speak of the scientific foundation of morality. You can't find, you can't find morality, a basis uh, for morality, from the scientific method, from science. Okay? They're completely different realms. In fact, just as a side note, I'm writing a paper um, on Thomas Aquinas. You guys know Thomas Aquinas? On Thomas Aquinas and how he would respond to guys like Stephen Hawking, and there's a guy named Lawrence Krauss. They're, they've written books on how you can get something from nothing, okay? How the universe kind of created itself from nothing. We'll get to the book uh, like that in a second. But you'll see these men are outside of their field of expertise. In fact, the questions they're trying to answer are not scientific questions. They're philosophic questions. The problem is much worse. Science, not only can science uh, not, uh, it, it doesn't hold the truth for, uh, you can't get it all truth through science, but the problem is much worse. It turns out science doesn't even seem to answer the questions of a child. Uh, British biologist and Nobel Prize winner Sir Peter Medawar says this, the existence of a limit to science is, however, made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things. Questions such as, how did everything begin? And what are we all here for? And what's the point of living? Science can't answer those questions, but those are the most fundamental questions in existence. Uh, John Lennox in his book expands on this idea a little bit uh, to show the limitations of science through a simple illustration. He says, suppose there's a big party. You know, we're all at this big party. And his Aunt Matilda has baked a cake, okay? And at this party, we have Nobel Prize winning scientists from every scientific discipline, okay? And, and, and we ask, we ask these Nobel Prize winning scientists to explain, to fully explain this cake, okay? Aunt Matilda's cake. And so uh, they go to work, the nutrition scientist, he tells us the number of calories in the cake and its nutritional effects, the biochemist, he informs us about the structure of the proteins, the fats, etc., in the cake. The chemist, he tells us about the elements involved and their bonding, the physicist, you know, he's able to analyze the cake in terms of fundamental particles. The mathematician, he offers some elegant equations about how the, the laws of physics are being described, how the particles are moving. Now these experts, each in their own terms, have explained the cake, but have they fully explained everything about the cake? Absolutely not. In fact, they can't answer the one question of why Aunt Matilda made the cake in the first place. Right? They can answer all the how questions, but they could never answer the why question. And so, and so, um, so these scientists are able to answer the how questions but not the why questions. John Lennox says the only way we shall ever get to answer uh, the question is if Aunt Matilda reveals it to us. But if she doesn't disclose the answer to us, no amount of scientific analysis will enlighten us. So let me make one more point about this before moving on. Just because Aunt Matilda can reveal the purpose, uh, just because Aunt Matilda can reveal the purpose of her making the cake, say a nephew's birthday or something, does not mean that our use of reason is now excluded. In fact, we need to use our reason to assess uh, if what she's saying about her nephew or whatever is actually true. In this case, reason is not opposed to revelation, it actually complements it, okay? And so now here's the thing. This raises the question of whether there is someone, like capital S someone, who stands in the same causal relationship to the universe as Aunt Matilda stands to the cake. Okay? And whether that someone has actually revealed something. And that's precisely what, the Christ what Christians claim. There is someone like that, and he has revealed himself through his word. Okay? And so, uh, it's uh, quite often, 
you'll hear that you must choose between God and science. And to drive home this point, uh, atheists will often talk, uh, refer to this famous conversation that took place between Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and uh, French mathematician Pierre Laplace. So Laplace is presenting his mathematical description of the solar system to his friend Napoleon. And Napoleon asks him where God fits into his mathematical equations. And Laplace famously replies in a French accent, so I'll try this. Sire, I have no need for that hypothesis. My French accent is always mean, by the way. I'm not saying French people are mean, but I have no need for that hypothesis. Many atheists take that to mean that Laplace had a mechanism, therefore he didn't need God. I can explain it all in terms of uh, laws of physics. Now, this, I think this actually is the furthest thing from the truth. This is actually a category mistake. And here's an illustration to kind of show the mistake that's being made. And we'll use a Ford Model T, the first automobile, to, uh, to make this illustration. Now, here's my question to you. Is the explanation of the engine for the Ford Model T due to the laws of internal combustion, or is the explanation Henry Ford? And the answer is, well, it's both. Okay? At one level, an engineer could say, yeah, the laws of thermal combustion are the cause of the inner workings of the engine. Uh, and that would explain in terms of law and mechanism. But just because we understand the mechanism doesn't mean we don't need Henry Ford. In fact, Henry Ford, the, the whole reason you have an engine to begin with is the result of Henry Ford, the agent causation. Okay? So these categories are very important, particularly when we look at the universe. Just because we have a universe uh, with a mechanism like the law of physics, does not mean that even if we understood all about the law of physics, the laws of physics, doesn't mean we can now exclude God as a possible explanation, which is precisely what scientists are trying to do today. Okay? In fact, Newton, when he discovered the law of gravity, and kind of had a mathematical description for that, he didn't say, now I have a mechanism, I don't need God. On the contrary, his discovery of the, me of the mechanism provided or proved an increase for his adoration for God. In fact, he went on to write probably uh, the greatest scientific work ever penned, okay? And that is the Principia Mathematica. And in the general scolium, don't ask me what that is, uh, he says, this, most, this is a scientific work, okay? I'll say, these guys never actually talked about God in their scientific work. Oh, yeah. This most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. This being governs all things, not as soul of the world, but as Lord over all. That's Newton, okay? And so he didn't say, I have gravity, now I don't need God. But that's exactly what Stephen Hawking does. If you guys have seen uh, his latest book, The Grand Design, which I've been going through for my essay, he says this. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. He goes on, spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing, why the universe exists, why we exist, and then he, he, he makes this extrapolation, it is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. Now, you guys don't need to be, you know, in a philosophy class to realize the universe would have to exist to create itself, right? It's a bootstrapping problem. There's other problems. Uh, he, he defines nothing as something. In fact, he obviously thinks the laws of physics, like gravity, were in play to cause the whole thing. So really, he's not talking about nothing. I mean, there's, you could go on and on, um, as I do for 20 pages of my paper, a comment like this. <laughs> You know, he, this is the same guy in the same book. He says, philosophy is dead. Those are his words. And then he goes on to do terrible philosophy. The rest of the <laughs> but he's not alone. There's others who have made this claim. Uh, Paul Davies, he says, there's no need to invoke anything supernatural in the origin of the universe or of life. I have never liked the idea of divine tinkering. It's very interesting that a lot of these scientists in their writings will actually come out and say, I don't like this. You know, I don't, you know, it, 
this is irritating to me, and, and, and it's how their feelings get, uh, get hurt or something by all this. For me, it is much more inspiring to believe that a set of mathematical laws can be so clever as to bring all of these things into being. Mathematical laws don't cause anything, just so we're clear. When I teach my kids about uh, Newton's laws of motion, we're talking about billiard <coughs> balls moving on a table. Let me tell you something. No law of physics has ever caused one of those balls to start moving. Okay? You know who gets balls, those balls to start moving on the table? People do. Okay? With cues. And so, and so these guys, this, uh, this stuff is just, just crazy to me. But here's where the rubber meets the road. It turns out that atheism cannot account for these things that make science possible. Okay? For example, atheism cannot account for the rational intelligibility of the universe at, at two ends. At one end, atheism cannot account for the rational mind, your and my rational mind, that is able to understand the universe. At the other, it cannot explain why there is a rational universe to begin with. Let me look at these two things, and, uh, and then maybe a couple minutes of questions. What? Do you want me just to end it right now? No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, you guys recognize this guy with the big beard? That's not Santa Claus. That's Charles Darwin. Uh, even Darwin realized that, you, that he cannot account for the reliability of human rationality. Surely science would collapse without human rationality. Uh, and that's agreed on by both parties, atheists and, and, and theists. However, the naturalist uh, cannot ground or uh, find a basis for rationality. This is what he says in a letter to his friend, uh, William Graham. He says, But then with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which have been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any, such, any convictions in such a mind? See, Darwin realized where his theory was going. If it's all just random chance, then why would we trust our own thinking in the matters of anything, uh, in particular when we study the universe? At the other end, so how do we trust our rational faculties on a naturalist worldview? But at the other end, why is it that when we look up at the heavens, there's this rationality to the universe? Um, so you have a guy like Albert Einstein, very famous theoretical German uh, physicist. He says, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. That it's yeah, comprehensible. I put incomprehensible. Right now. That's, not, that's not good for this. Okay, yeah, it's comprehensible. That's right. Now, this doesn't make any sense. Listen, and this should kind of blow your mind. Hopefully, it will. And I just do one illustration. How can the mathematical equations that we, you know, sitting at our desk, writing on a piece of paper, somehow correspond to the real world? Like, this should, this should really uh, interest us. In fact, uh, there's a man named Peter Higgs. You guys know about the Higgs boson? Kind of. Well, this is kind of, this is big news as of late. Um, Scientists have been, in, have been searching for this one particle, this one particle that's actually supposed to give mass to everything. And it turns out a guy named Peter Higgs, in 1964, just with pen and paper, came up with this idea of the Higgs boson. And in, in the media they were calling it the God particle. It has nothing to do with God, so I don't know why they were calling it that. But, um, the Higgs boson, okay? Now check this out. Uh, in 2013, that is actually this year in March, he was actually awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. Because at the Large Hadron Collider, you guys know what the Large Hadron Collider? They spent, now talk about a waste of money, I mean I'm a scientist, but this is over $10 billion to build this particle accelerator so they can smash particles together, okay? And through this, uh, and through using, I mean, it's miles long um, and all underground, it actually 
uh, they've actually discovered that, hey, the Higgs field, the Higgs boson actually exists. And this is just this blows my mind. 50 years later, after billions of dollars are spent, uh, and the greatest minds in the world working on this, they actually found something in reality that corresponded to something 50 years ago. That someone just came up with pen and paper about how the world, you know, should, if it follows these laws. And that to me just blows my mind. That if the world really is just a chaotic explosion, and there is no law, uh, there's no creator or sustainer to it, then why would, we, why would anyone believe that that would actually be possible? The fact that it is possible, I think, is a crazy good argument for there being a God who created uh, this way. And so, uh, last slide I'll do. It's not really my last slide, but I'll, uh, I'll have to wrap it up here. So, it turns out that for science to even be possible, a number of things have to be presupposed. Okay? Um, like the existence of an objectively real world, the comprehensibility of the, the world, the reliability of our senses, our rationality, as, as Darwin pointed out, um, the orderliness and uniformity of nature, all of those things have to be assumed. But whose worldview actually has the goods to ground all of those things? Well, not the naturalist, okay? He has to actually just assume them. He actually hijacks the Christian worldview as I'll uh, show you next class. But those things, their worldview can't support those claims. Okay? In fact, what they do is they come join us and they actually have to rest their feet on theism as they argue against theism. Okay? Which is, uh, which is interesting. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to cut it off here. Does anyone have any Kess Jones? That's actually French. <laughs> You should see me when I supply teach French class. <laughs> <laughs> Students learn. Anyone have any questions about anything I just said? Any, uh, anyone disagree? Everybody? All right, let's keep going. No, seriously. You guys don't have any questions? Well, just because this seems like a good stopping point, I do have, like, 15 more slides. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but uh, we'll continue this on. I mean, we got three lessons to get through everything. Remember, we're going to deal with the evidence next class. Um, some things that if maybe you came today and you assumed, hey, this isn't about the age of the earth. What's up with that? I'm not talking about the age of the earth. You can ask me those questions if you want. But I'm, I'm specifically not dealing with it. The other thing I'm not dealing with is evolution. Um, Although we will deal a little bit with some stuff when we talk about the origin of life and biological information. But those are whole other topics that would need a couple of classes. Although I did email Ron. And uh, you, am I on for two more? For sure. Yeah? Yeah, 95%. Okay, so, so actually, you don't, you're stuck with me for more weeks than you thought. <laughs> so uh, I'm taking a class, I think, the week when this is done, and then, um, so I won't be able to make it uh, to the Wednesday night, but after that, I'm going to do two talks, one on, are Christianity and, uh, and evolution compatible? Now, I actually disagree with um, Paul Franks. He was here last week. Um, and that's not a good thing, actually, because he's a smart guy. <laughs> and I'm like a mental midget. I'm a tall man. So, uh, what I will be dealing with the logic, the logic of the two views. I think if you properly understand evolution, they are incompatible logically. I actually wrote a ten-page paper on that for my, for my class uh, that I sent to uh, Paul. Uh, <laughs> he's not here, is he? Uh, so, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. Uh, I actually look at this. I remember I taught biological evolution, so I'm gonna look at all the arguments in the textbooks that your kids, or maybe some of you, if you're high school age, um, will see um, and answer those. And then the theological arguments, which I think, as Christians, we gotta take very seriously. And so, that'll probably take two classes um, doing all of that. Um, that's about it. So maybe I'll just pray for you, and then you can go. 
Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this opportunity where we can come together and, uh, and be in your house on a Wednesday. I think that's just so cool. Um, God, I pray that some of the things that were said today would actually uh, register. Um, I pray that if anything was, uh, anything in error was said, that, uh, that it would be erased and that, um, and that uh, most of all, that you would be glorified through this class. Um, that people would come to know you uh, through something that was said in this, in this class. I pray that the people would not hold this information and keep it to themselves selfishly. I, think, I, I pray that uh, they would use this information to build your kingdom up. And, uh, and I pray that you just take everyone home safely. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, see you next week, folks. Thank <laughs> you.